Uh, Holbrook Travel is pleased to be bringing you this webinar today, Ethics in Wildlife Photography with Jennifer Lee Warner. Let's see here. Uh, we are joined by Jennifer Lee Warner today. Um, she's going to be sharing uh, some guidelines and some tips for being a responsible photographer when you're out in the field, um, especially when you're photographing wildlife. Um, whether you're a professional or an amateur, a hobbyist, um, or just someone who happens to be out taking a hike and wants to take some photos, um, ways that you can um, be a little bit more responsible and, and better care for the wildlife that you're seeing. Um, so again, our guest today is Jennifer Lee Warner. Uh, Jennifer is the Ethics Committee Chair for the uh, North American Nature Photography Association, or NAMPA. Uh, she also has over 15 years of experience as a fine art and conservation photographer um, and she uses her photography to help inspire other people uh, to better care for our earth so um, we're really pleased to have her here today uh, jennifer lives in california and so she leads tours locally but also internationally um, in destinations around the world so uh, places as far flung as galapagos and namibia and alaska and yellowstone and a bunch of other places so um, she's going to tell you a little bit more about that as well. Uh, so with that, welcome, Jennifer. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, all right, and I'm just going to take over the screen here. And all right, mm -hmm. so there we go. Um, all right, well, thank you for that lovely introduction. I'm so excited to be here today. Um, and let's see. There we go. Um, like you said, I am uh, Jennifer Lee Warner and the North American Nature Photographers Association's Ethics Committee Chair, or NAMPA. Um, so I always knew I wanted to be a wildlife photographer. I had such a strong desire, um, even as a child, to protect the living creatures of this world. And I found that photography was a very powerful tool to share their stories. But the more I traveled around the world, to document these living creatures, the more I realized that there was a need to, fo uh, to protect um, species against those who are seeking to photograph them as well. We as photographers get rare opportunities to engage with our wild subjects and it is of the utmost important that, importance that we do not take that privilege lightly. So today we're just gonna do um, a few tips on knowledge of subject and place knowledge of rules and laws, expertise and responsibilities, how close is too close, and then just a little bit of talking about um, cap uh, photographing captive wildlife as well. Um, just a little bit about me. Um, I have been photographing professionally for 15 years. I've photographed throughout North America, Africa, India, Australia, and then parts of Central and South America as well. Uh, lead photo tours, um, both locally and internationally, some through Holbrook as well. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the trips I have coming up next year through Holbrook. And um, like I said, I am the Ethics Committee Chair for North America Nature Photographers Association. I've had the great privilege of working with some of the best photographers in the country on um, creating some ethical guidelines for photographing wildlife and we are going to be sharing some of the um, the information that comes from that committee on today's call. Um, I first got um, connected with Holbrook last year and I was so privileged to get to travel to Galapagos Islands with, um, with Holbrook and I was there with Chris and Andrea and a bunch of other fantastic um, people. And we had a fantastic time, got to really experience um, all of the amazing things that Holbrook has to offer. And I'm excited to be leading some more trips um, through Holbrook. I'm also an award-winning photographer. I um, recently uh, got this award um, through NAMPA. They have an annual competition and they just introduced a conservation category and I was the judge's choice winner with this image and to me this was really important. Um, you know awards are great and I love you know getting awards just as much as anyone else but I was really excited to see that the judges took this picture seriously and understood this as a conservation issue when we're overcrowding our wildlife in national parks. And these are the challenges that these animals are having to face each and every day. 
So um, I first got started with um, teaching about ethics when I was in my early 20s, and it really came from this picture. And this is a sea turtle that I photographed in Hawaii. I had traveled to the big island um, to photograph them, and immediately after finding these turtles that were resting on the beach, he's just sleeping, don't worry, he's not dead, he's just sleeping, um, but a man had been smoking a cigarette. I didn't know him. He's just a tourist was smoking a cigarette. And there's signs warning, you know, please stay back from turtles, let them have their space. He disregarded all of those signs, walked right past um, those and started smoking in the turtle's face. And I was just livid. I was so mad that anyone would have such little respect for wildlife. But what I really regretted about that situation was that I didn't take a picture. I didn't do anything about it. I just left in disgust. And a few years later, I was photographing sea lions in La Jolla in Southern California when a similar thing happened. I came across this man who was wanting to take a selfie with this emaciated sea lion pup. And instead of walking away in disgust like I had done before, I decided to document what happened. And this picture has now become a symbol of the work that I do. And I just want people to see how we're treating the wildlife that we're photographing and make people understand that these animals have lives long after we leave them and that the consequences of our actions could, could lead um, to situations that they have to live with the rest of their lives. Um, so how does this help you and, you know, your travel experiences? So. Um, having an ethical approach to photographing wildlife not only benefits the animals, but can also have a positive impact on your travel experience. So understanding the needs of wildlife you encounter gives you a greater understanding of the world around us. And knowing that you're making a positive impact on the animals' lives leaves you feeling like the encounter you had was a positive one. If you're a tour leader, showing your guests that you care about the animals that you're taking them to see um, will give you credibility as a leader, which will lead to more business in the future. So this means that we always need to put the welfare of our subjects before us and our photographs. Um, getting to know this, your subjects will help better prepare you, so, prepare you for what you're going to find in the field. If you understand an animal's behavior and you can learn their patterns, you'll be less likely to interfere with an animal's life cycle. So I found this comic strip and I think this is a perfect example of how we can inadvertently do harm to wildlife. The strip shows of a photographer who's being praised for his work after spending the entire day playing recorded bird calls to lure a bird in for a photograph. Meanwhile, the female sits at the nest with her starving chicks because her mate never showed up to feed them. It's so important that we're thinking about our actions in the field and asking ourselves if the, those results of those actions are doing more harm than good at the end of the day. Accumulative damages can occur over time. Scaring a bird into flight or causing an animal to move away from a food source can use a valuable energy. Wildlife have so many other factors to consider when fighting to survive, and our need to get a photograph should not add to that stress if we can avoid it. A great way to know if you're causing stress to, the, to an animal is to look for a warning signs. For some species, that may be the flick of a tail, like in a bison, or for other species, it may be the raising of their head when they're grazing. Learn about these warning signs ahead of time and be on the lookout for these behaviors when you're out in the field. If you notice that an animal looks scared or uncomfortable, then you should back up or move out. For some species, it may be a matter of camouflaging yourself. So as you can see in this picture, these, um, this baby is definitely looking at these, these kids who are approaching too closely. But you might wanna camouflage yourself in order to be less threatening. This might be using a longer lens or wearing dark fabrics that make less noise when you walk. You might also wanna invest in a photo blind or use your vehicle to hide yourself. Whatever you decide to use, just have the animal's best interest in mind and come prepared. Eliminating stress to wildlife is not the only thing to consider when out in the field. Ecosystems can be par uh, particularly vulnerable as well. Staying on paths and trails will help lessen your impact um, by physically trampling or harming plants and landscapes. And pay close attention to signs that are uh, posted warning of these particularly vulnerable vegetation. As you can see in this picture, this deer is doing his part to make sure he's following the signs and the guidelines. Um, with any subject though, just do your research beforehand 
and better uh, that'll better equip yourself for what you're going to find in the field. Wandering off trail may not seem like a big deal, but if you're stepping on wildflowers in order to get to that location, um, you could be damaging a potential food source. So each region that you visit has their own set of rules and laws. Do your research ahead of time and know what these rules are before you visit. Some areas may be required to have a permit to enter, while other areas may be off limits during certain times of the year. It's never okay to enter um, an area that's on private property or closed to the public without gaining special permission. Um, each public land, such as national and state parks, has laws pertaining to how close you can get to wildlife. And you should look up these laws before you visit um, so that you know what they are. Some signs may also indicate whether or not it's safe to bring pets on paths and trails. And it's never okay to ignore these warning signs. They're not only there to keep you safe, but to provide the wildlife a safe place to live as well. In La Jolla, there are signs indicating um, whether um, it's legal or not to approach marine animals, which it is illegal to approach marine animals, um, particularly harbor seals when they're in pupping. So this sign not only tells you what not to do, but it tells you why, which I like this sign a lot because it is telling you what the repercussions of those actions are. Unfortunately, not everybody follows signs and people do end up approaching sea lion pups, which can cause the pup abandonment and ultimately could lead to the death of that baby. Uh, the other animals that um, in that area in La Jolla that are also disturbed quite frequently are sea lions. Um, they also are using this area as a rookery, so approaching sea lions is also a dangerous situation. Um, I also encountered this behavior happening in, um, oops, there we go, in Hawaii with Hawaiian monk seals. Hawaiian monk seals are the most endangered of the seal um, species and are particularly sensitive to wildlife harassment. Seals and sea lions need beaches to rest and will eventually drown if they don't get um, time on the beach to rest. So giving them their space could be essential to their survival. Another thing to consider this time of year is um, animals with young. Wildlife can be very protective and can be very aggressive towards um, anyone who approaches. In this situation, a man was just walking on a trail when he came across this Egyptian goose family. Instead of finding another route or waiting for the geese to move on their own, he attempted to just pass them. The geese gave plenty of warning signs to this um, individual to let them know that they were not comfortable with him getting that close to their chicks. And he soon realized that this was ultimately a very big mistake when the goose bit him right in the butt. So we make sure that we're paying attention to what the animals are trying to tell us. They will almost always give you a warning before they attack you. Um, let's see. And sorry, I got a little. All right, so um, another thing to consider is in the absence of wildlife management, you should always be using your best judgment when out in the field. Remember that you're a guest in the homes of these wild animals and that the actions that you take could lead to consequences that these animals may have to live with the rest of their lives. Try to equate yourself with laws that pertain to drones as well. Um, remote control devices are, um, uh, the rules are changing at a rapid pace. So try your best to stay up with technology if you own a remote control device like a drone. According to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services, um, areas that are considered ecologically sensitive, including lands within the National Wildlife Refuge System that are host to endangered or um, threatened species can also be disproportionately affected by drone flights. Um, remember that national parks um, ban drones within there. So if you see these signs, make sure you're not disregarding them and that you are not flying your drone in national parks. You should also be watching for nesting birds if you're flying a drone and don't fly your drone near nesting birds. It can also cause them to attack your drone and or abandon their nests. So now let's talk about personal responsibility. Um, if you're anything like me, you probably like to be the only one out enjoying the nice, quiet, calm of nature. 
but if you're anything like me, that probably rarely gets to happen. Most cases, you're going to find others out enjoying the scene as well. Before joining a group, it's always best to ask if um, it's okay that you join their group. In some cases, the larger the group, the more likely it might scare an animal away from a scene. So be respectful when you show up. Don't scare the animal away while other people are watching. Um, if you do observe people acting inappropriate around wildlife, it's best not to assume that they're purposely trying to be harmful. Just tactfully inform them of how they can behave without interfering with the animal. In some cases, uh, people will become a defensive if you try to correct them. So it's best not to, to fight with people in the field. Um, just gently try to inform them. If they're not listening to it, it's okay. Just go ahead and report the behavior to the nearest wildlife officer. Um, all right, so there are other situations that might occur on a regional basis. Um, in this example, um, this would be disease transmission. I think we can all probably relate right now to um, disease transmission and how that can be um, very harmful to a community, whether that's people or wildlife. In this case, um, wildlife are drawn towards roads in the winter time um, because they like to lick the salt on the asphalt or directly off of vehicles. Um, although there's no evidence of vehicle licking to be harmful, it has been known to cause disease transmission. So in this case, um, this unnatural behavior by bighorn sheep can, can cause them to congregate. And from licking one vehicle and another licking a vehicle who have um, what these sheep typically have is a pneumonia causing bacterial pathogens. Um, these are passed by saliva and or droplets in the air. So when one sheep licks the vehicle and the other sheep licks the vehicle, it causes them to get sick and passes it along throughout the herd, which can cause an entire herd of sheep um, to get become very sick and die. Um, so if you do see this behavior, um, instead of just letting it happen, it's important to discourage them from doing this behavior by just leaving the scene. Another um, subject that I want to pay close attention to is bears. So areas like the greater Yellowstone area, people come from all over the world to visit grizzly bears in the wild. Seeing your first grizzly bear can be very exciting. Actually, seeing your hundredth grizzly bear can be very exciting. Exciting. And with all that excitement, um, you can lose all common sense and try to get as close to the animal as possible, which is very dangerous. You should always be staying a minimum of 100 yards away from bears. Use as long a lens as possible when you're photographing. And if you are doing any hiking out into bear country, you should always be carrying bear spray. Um, if you do encounter a bear, just back away slowly but never turn your back and run. Another thing to consider when in bear country is bear jams. So we're obviously not the only ones out looking for bears when we are photographing and we wanna make sure that we are using common sense. So when vehicles are driving by and we're looking for bears, they're not looking at the people in the road, they're looking at the bears too and they can cause accidents. So you wanna make sure you're being very careful, you're not standing in the road to photograph. And if you're try trying to cross the road, you're watching for traffic and just make the assumption that the car doesn't, isn't looking at you, they're looking at the bear. Um, another thing to consider is that bears are most likely near roads because they're, they themselves are trying to cross. So give, themselves, give the bear plenty of space to cross the road safely. Oftentimes I see photographers following the bear as it walks along the road. The bear's trying to cross, so if you can just stop the bear will eventually cross in front of you. But most importantly, just be a good role model. If people see you using nice photography equipment, they make the assumption that you know what you're doing. So the actions that you take can inadvertently set a precedent for what other photographers do. So set a positive precedent and exhibit positive behavior. So I mentioned earlier that each area has safe distance rules. Um, in a park like Yellowstone, those rules are that you need to stay at least 100 yards away from bears and wolves and 25 yards away from other animals such as elk and bison. If an animal approaches you, then you should back up um, and 
never turn your back and run because it may cause the animal to charge. Um, another thing to consider is your safety and the safety of everyone else around you. That means if you're stopping to photograph wildlife, you should be pulling completely off the side of the road. And that means putting all four tires off the side of the road and use pullouts whenever possible. Sometimes the animals may actually cross the road in front of you. In that case, just stay in your vehicle and let them cross at their own pace and at their own time. Um, don't, don't encourage them to move along because that might cause them to panic and run into a dangerous situation. Sometimes they'll walk directly on the road, just stop and wait for them to eventually move. Um, this goes for boats as well. So there's safe distance rules when it comes to approaching marine animals as well. That's 100 yards from whales, 50 yards away from dolphins and seals, sea lions. Um, and just a few other rules here for, or guidelines here for not disturbing marine animals, such as um, trying not to separate uh, whales from their calves and doing your best not to trap a whale into um, an area that they can't get out of, like between boats. Um, this, uh, this guideline right here is coming from the Fisheries and Oceans Canada. This is some whale guidelines for different types of whales. So if you're going out on, on a boat, make sure you understand the different guidelines for different types of species. Um, from seaotters.com, they put together this great document showing what a harassed otter looks like. So you want to make sure if the otter is paying a lot of attention to you, it probably means you're harassing it. That goes for seals and sea lions as well. If they're resting, they're usually laying their head down. If their head is up and they're looking at you, you're probably too close. So the next topic is one that's very near and dear to my heart, and that's the importance of never feeding wild animals, um, particularly predators. So there's a lot of reasons why photographers feel the need to feed a wild animal. For much of the time, it's because they're trying to lure an animal in for a photograph. Um, when we do that, um, the animal starts to associate people with food, and that's a death sentence for that animal. Wildlife can become aggressive um, and lose their fear of people entirely, or they're drawn towards roads where they're hit by cars. It's just important that we're never using food or any other type of bait to lure wildlife in closer. So an example here is you can see that this fox had lost all fear of humans. The park ranger who was picking up trash when I arrived on the scene had this look of despair in her eyes as she knew that this fox had clearly become habituated and, and most likely have a shortened life because of it. Um, it was clear as I watched this fox as it ran up to every car that approached that it was only a matter of time before she was hit by a car. I never did see how this played out, but as most of us have seen before, Wildlife strikes happen every day. As a matter of fact, they happen one million times a day. So we need to do our part not to lure wildlife closer to the roads. That also goes for marine animals too. We don't want them to be struck by boats either. Um, owl baiting is another common practice that happens within the wildlife photography community. This is when um, photographers buy store-bought mouse and throw them to wild owls in order to get action shots. Um, there's a lot of reasons why this is unethical and why it should never be practiced. For one, owls can hunt for themselves just fine. They don't need you to feed them. Um, it causes habituation and the owls are drawn towards roads. Um, another thing to note is owl baiting is almost never allowed in photography contests or publications. So there's no point in doing it. Just, looking for, just look for natural behavior. Um, when it comes to bird feeders, bird feeders are not, owl bait, or not the same as owl baiting. Um, and there is a lot, of be, um, a lot of research being done indicating that there isn't a lot of harm being caused by bird feeders. However, there's some things that you really need to pay attention if you're going to use bird feeders. That is keeping them away from windows so we are avoiding window strikes. You need to make sure that you're cleaning the bird feeder regularly and you should be on the lookout for predators. So whether they are raptors or land predators, um, they use the bird feeders as baiting stations. Um, so if you do notice that a predator is lurking around your bird feeder, take the feeder down for a period of time until you've noticed the predator has moved on, then you can go ahead and 
put the bird feeder back up. So just a little quote here, interacting with wildlife only when they want to interact with you means you're going to get better photographs. The animal also look far more relaxed and natural. So I'm often asked if I can't lure an animal in for a photograph, how do I get up close pictures of wildlife that are afraid of people? And the best answer to that is to camouflage yourself. Um, you can use a photography blind. It's a great way to get up close behavior of animals that are afraid of people without them really noticing that you're there. Photography blinds can come in all shapes and sizes. My personal favorite is using my vehicle as a photography blind. Um, you can stay fairly comfortable and most animals are used to cars going by. So as long as you're not getting out of your vehicle, they don't usually seem to mind your presence. Another thing to consider is when you're out on foot, wildlife can be very unpredictable and they can move very quietly without you knowing. So always know what's behind you as well as what's in front of you. Um, otherwise you might end up like this couple and have an unexpected visitor following you back to your car. Um, so a few more tips. So when you're out on foot, try to get into the mindset of the animal. Are you a predator or a prey in their eyes? They're going to react to you based on this information. So if you are um, wearing dark fabrics that make less noise when you walk, um, will help you blend into their surroundings. Get low. Um, this really only applies to animals that see you as a predator. Getting low will make you seem less threatening. If they see you as prey, like a bear, I would not recommend this behavior because they might think of you as their next meal. Um, avoid direct, walking directly at an animal. Um, if you can walk at an angle and avoid contact, a lot of animals will think you can't see them and they'll avoid moving so that they don't you know, catch your eye. So if you can do this behavior, they're more likely to stay in place for you. And be quiet. Oftentimes I hear of people talking and making a lot of noise, playing music when they're out in the wilderness. This is just scaring all wildlife away. So if you're really looking for wildlife, try to be as quiet as possible. But most importantly, never block an animal's escape route. Um, if Once you've located the animal you're looking for, see where the animal's going to be able to escape if it wants to leave. Um, we should never be blocking an animal's escape route. If you do notice that an animal is showing signs of aggression, you should just leave. Um, just like you wouldn't want someone coming into your house and taking your picture without your permission, an animal feel that might feel like that as well. So we should always allow them to decline a photo session if they would like to. Um, it's also important never to chase an animal. So if the animal does decide to leave, don't chase it further into the, into the woods. Not only are you causing it to panic, which could lead it to tripping and hurting themselves or running into traffic, but you're not really getting good pictures if you're chasing an animal either. The best pictures come when animals feel comfortable enough to go about its daily life as if you're no longer there. It may take time to build up a relationship, but trust me, the end results are well worth the wait. So the last thing I'm going to talk about here is photographing captive animals. Um, there are a lot of reasons why people photograph captive animals. Um, and there are a lot of facilities that have captive animals um, for you to photograph. But it's important to note that not all facilities are the same. I think most of you or a lot of you maybe had watched the Netflix um, show Tiger King that came out. And I think this is a perfect example of where people might want to encounter wildlife in a non-ethical behavior. So um, if you're looking for a facility, and I'm not saying that photographing captive animals is unethical, but there are some guidelines to doing so. First of all, see if it's an accredited facility. Um, AZA, or Association of Zoos and Aquariums, have an accreditation program that looks at a variety of things to determine whether or not the, the facility is operating ethically. That includes, does the animal have enough space? Is it being fed properly? Um, does it have the, the right amount of support staff, veterinary care, things of that nature? So look for that logo, AZA, if you're looking for a facility. Um, a another things to think about before choosing the facility you're going to photograph. Um, like I said, is it AZA? Does the facility serve a conservation or educational purpose? 
if the facility offers human animal contact, is it done in a manner that is safe for both the animal and the person? Ask yourself, where does the animals come from? Are they born at the facility? And if so, are they following the species survival um, plan for genetic diversity? Are the animals captured in the wild? Or were they bought from another facility? And then lastly, ask yourself what happens to these animals once there's no longer a use for them. So all of these things are going to determine whether or not this is a, a good or not so good location to be photographing animals. And we want to discourage facilities that are not treating animals properly. Um, all right, so I'm just going to show you a few images here that I took ethically and just give you a little background on what it is I photographed and how I did it. So, um, you know, photographing animals ethically is not always easy, I'll admit. Sometimes it's easier to take a shortcut, but it's not in the best interest of you or the animal. So, you know, do your part to get the images appropriately, ethically. It's going to make you have a better um, reputation in the photo community. It'll make you feel better knowing that you didn't do hurt, harm to the animal. So this example here, these bears, they are wild. They were photographed in Katmai National Park at a location called Brooks Falls. And these bears um, are grizzly bears that are fishing along the river. This is a mom and her one-year-old cub. I'll show you where I photographed it. So here is the um, platform that the National Park System has built. So you are have some separation from the river. These bears are coming here naturally to fish for salmon. And you can kind of see the grass in the lower left hand side of the frame. The bears were down on the river. So they are very close. But there is separation for me and the bear. The next photograph is a, of a Maasai giraffe. This photograph was photographed in the Maasai Mara in Kenya. And as you can see, it's a very unique angle. I'm photographing it from above. And this is because I did it from a hot air balloon. Hot air balloons allow you to float seamlessly over the animals and will typically not cause them stress like a helicopter would. Um, underwater. So this uh, photograph of a green sea turtle was photographed in Maui. And it's important to note that when you're photographing in the water that you're not chasing animals. They have a lot easier time to get away from you, but it's still very stressful if you're chasing after them. So if you do spot wildlife like a turtle or a seal in the water, just stay still. And a lot of times they'll come closer to you because they're curious. So in this case, I was scuba diving. Uh, I'm sorry, I was snorkeling and I just saw the turtle. I waited and it came up for a breath and then dove. Um, Rhinos. So these are white rhinos in Zambia. Um, there's some very strong guidelines when it comes to photographing um, rhinoceroses. So these are wild. They are in Africa. And um, one of the things that's really important to know is that you're not divulging um, specific location data when you're sharing pictures like this. So giving me something a very general like the country. Um, will help deter poachers from um, identifying the locations of these animals. Another thing to know with these species is they are, although wild, they're protected um, around the clock from these guides right here. Um, they do carry guns, but not really for the rhinos. They're carrying them for poachers. So hiring a guide and having them show you where the animals are is one way to be able to photograph without causing um, the animals to be in danger of poachers. Sandhill cranes. So I usually photograph the sandhill crane migration as they travel um, from their wintering grounds up to their breeding grounds. During this migration, they get very scared of people because they are hunted. So in order to do this without scaring them away from this very critical resting area, I used a pop-up blind. So this is a portable blind that I was able to put in um, on the riverbank. I can hide in there and they don't see me coming. Um, elephants. These elephants were photographed in Samburu in Kenya. Um, when it comes to photographing elephants, animals like that in Africa, I'm using a vehicle with a pop-up top. This way I'm not getting out on foot and they usually don't seem to mind. 
this is a Cape Buffalo that I, or I'm sorry, this is a water buffalo that I photographed in India. This is in Kaziranga National Park. And this, um, this buffalo was just cooling off in the water and was coming out, which is why it's dripping. In this case, I'm also using a safari vehicle. This is a different type of vehicle. So we're not allowed to get out, but you can raise up and get the angle that you need in order to photograph the, uh, the buffaloes or whatever other animals you might find in India. Um, the Galapagos, these are Galapagos hawks. They are fighting over a seal um, kill that they made. And um, although the animals in the Galapagos tend to not be quite as scared of people, which allows you to get a little closer, you still want to keep a respectful distance and you want to make sure that you're not interfering with any behavior. So in this case, um, we are keeping our distance and just laying on the ground and photographing um, from a still position. So plant yourself and then let the magic happen in front of you. Um, tigers, same thing with in India, we're in those vehicles. Um, I don't have a picture, but Imagine like with the buffalo, um, we're in the vehicles. Cheetah, um, now this picture is of a captive animal. It's the only captive image that I have in this show, but I wanted to point out that photographing captive animals, you should, anytime you're sharing, explain why it's captive and how it's being cared for. In this case, this cheetah is at the Cheetah Conservation Fund in Namibia. It was rescued from the illegal wildlife trade when it was three days old and then sent to the Cheetah Conservation Fund um, when it was 10 days old and was hand raised. It cannot go back into the wild because it was never taught how to hunt from its mother. So unfortunately, it has to stay in captivity and act as an ambassador for its species. Because this cat was hand raised and at this point, this, this cheetah is only seven months old, I'm able to get a little closer than I would to a wild, uh, a wild cheetah. Um, this picture was taken near my home in Southern California last year of the super bloom. These poppies were, um, they come about once every 10 years when we've got heavy rains and then followed by, um, you know, or it's a lot of dry and then a heavy rain causes these wildflowers to bloom like this. Uh, people were trampling these flowers. They were stepping on them. They were picking them. One time and even a helicopter landed in amongst the flowers. When this happens, it causes the uh, poppies not to germinate again, which means they're not going to bloom again. So if you damage the flowers, you're potentially leading this to not being able to um, make any more flowers and we won't enjoy these super blooms anymore. So in this case, I'm on a trail. So I'm not um, stepping on any flowers, not damaging anything. I'm just on the paved trail. So just making sure you can view things, you can photograph them. You just need to do them from the appropriate um, spaces. Um, and hummingbirds. So a lot of people photograph hummingbirds. Um, a lot of people use feeders to do so. I have a bird feeder. I don't usually use it for photographs, more just to enjoy them at my window. However, this, this bird um, was in Laguna Beach in California. I saw this bird every single time I did a photo tour. I knew the flowers that it liked. I knew where it loved to, um, to sit throughout the day. So finding these locations and then giving yourself a little bit of space and waiting for them to arrive um, is a much more enjoyable way of viewing wildlife than trying to get it to come to you. Just find out where it likes to feed and go to it. Um, and then these vervet monkeys, these were in South Africa in Kruger National Park. I was in a campsite. I knew these monkeys like to hang out in the trees around the campsite. So I just sat on the grass and waited for them to come to me. They do bite, so you do need to be careful. But as long as you you're not feeding them, you're not luring them, you just kind of sit amongst them. They sat down and started nursing their young and kind of just hung out with me. So sometimes if you can just be calm and quiet and just patient, the wildlife will come to you. And then lastly, uh, I just wanted to put a landscape in here. This is in Wyoming. I'm on just the side of the road in the winter time, just waiting for the magic to happen. And if you, can pre-visualize what you want um, and then just be patient, you'll get a picture like this. All right, so before I hand it over for questions, just a little self-promotion, I have a workshop coming up on Saturday 
If you want to learn how to make a little bit of money with your photography or any type of art, I can teach you how to set up an online art store. Um, this is noon Pacific time. And if you go to my website um, at experiencewildlife.com, there is a link to sign up for that. Um, and then I've got three tours with Holbrook next year. So in May, I'm going to the Galapagos Islands. In June, we'll be going to Namibia and we'll stop at the Cheetah Conservation Fund and get to see some of those um, ambassador cheetahs. And then in July, we'll be heading to Alaska. So seeing some bears and whales, sea otters and puffins, things like that. And you can find all those tours on the Holbrook website. Um, so I always like to end with take nothing but pictures, leave nothing but footprints and kill nothing but time. One of my very favorite quotes. And uh, like I said, I'm with uh, North American Nature Photographers Association. The website is nampa.org and there is some great ethical guides that you can download right off their website. And uh, this is my contact information. Um, I love to contact, you know, I love to chat with people. So you can always reach me um, with my email address or check out my website, see the things I offer um, or run me on social media, follow my pages and uh, stay connected with what I'm doing. All right, I'm going to pass it over for questions now. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer. That was really interesting. And um, the eye candy at the end was just great. You've got some really beautiful photos. So thank you for sharing those with us. Yeah. I am. Uh, yeah, so we'll go ahead and get started with some photos. Um, before we do, I'll also just um, introduce Debbie Jordan, our Holbrook ambassador. She'll um, join us as well to be able to answer any of the more travel related uh, questions that you may have. So Debbie, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Um, and um, yeah, we've got some great uh, questions from people. Um, if you missed the beginning part of our webinar, um, if you're looking at your control panel, there's a Q&A button at the very bottom. You can click on that and you should be able to type in your question and submit it that way. Um, so uh, please send in any questions that you have. Um, so Jennifer, uh, I know that you discussed this in your presentation, but it is a question that has come up a lot and I know a lot of people are interested in and that has to do with um, approaching people that you see who are maybe not behaving as ethically as they should. Um, I know you said that a lot of times people are not necessarily intentionally um, causing harm, but if you see that, um, what have you found works best for you in terms of wording to approach people? Um, and also, do you, have you gotten more comfortable with it as you've approached more people? Yeah, so one of the things I learned very quickly is if you try to tell people what to do, they don't like it. <laughs> no surprise there. Um, so. I struggled with that a lot in my career, and I will say that that's probably the number one thing that people come up to me is they say they're so frustrated, they see this, it makes them not want to visit some of these locations, and um, I can completely understand that. However, the more I've been um, encountering people, the more I've realized that um, not just telling people what to do, but why what they're doing is harmful, a lot of times people just don't know. and they want to know why. Um, so a great example, I was photographing the harbor seals in La Jolla earlier this year, and um, they have closed down the beaches so that people can't go down and um, harass the animals, but you can still view them from above. And this younger couple was standing there and this guy was making sea lion noises, barking at the, anim at the animals. And it was very disruptive. And so I went up to him and I said, I, it would be really, um, it would be really nice if you could stop doing that. And he just said, why? And I, so I told him, you know, you're making sea lion noises to seals. You're scaring them. They're trying to give birth and raise their young. And we don't want them to be scared of this place, which is safe for them to do so. And once I realized, once he realized that he was like, I had no idea. I'm so sorry. And he stopped. So sometimes just giving them the why, um, is a great way to generate an actual conversation. But if someone does become aggressive, I never instigate a fight. Um, I've seen people get very physical with each other and I don't encourage that either. So I just find, you know, whether it's the national parks or, you know, park rangers or lifeguards, whoever is monitoring that area, I just report the behavior and let somebody with a little more of official 
capacity take care of it. Great. Um, we also have a lot of questions about what kind of equipment you're using, um, both in terms of the camera that you use and also the lens that um, is shown in some of the photos that you shared. Um, and also a question about what kind of camera you might recommend for someone just getting started. Yeah. So um, I am an unusual photographer who is not brand loyal. Um, mm -hmm. I have been photographing with Canon for a very long time, but I've recently switched to Nikon. And I can tell you that you know, both cameras are great. They have wonderful features. Um, I know photographers who use the Sony mirrorless. Those are great too. They all are just different. So whatever you're comfortable with is gonna be the right camera for you. So I really recommend testing several types of cameras. If you go to conferences like um, Nampa has a biannual conference and they let you test out equipment, same with Imaging USA, and there's a couple different conferences. You know, get rent equipment or borrow it and get to know what feels right to you. Um, and that's going to be the right camera for you. So um, what I'm using right now is a Nikon D850. Um, it is very fast, which I think is very helpful when you're photographing, especially birds. It has a very fast um, shutter um, frames per second. Um, and I use, I personally like to use um, lenses that um, are zoom, which means that they are going from uh, have multiple focal lengths. So right now I have the, excuse me, the Nikon um, 200 to 500 millimeter. Um, I like that because I want to be able to not disturb the wildlife as much as possible. So I'm going to be able to be more versatile in how I move around. Um, although I know a lot of photographers that use prime lenses, a prime lens is going to give you a little bit more um, flexibility with lighting conditions and it's going to just be um, a little easier to get teleconverters on there so if you're using a um, say a prime 600 millimeter lens with a 2x teleconverter you're going to be able to get really far without having to get close up to wildlife so just a couple different options um, but usually with wildlife the bigger the better um, you want to try to stay away from the wildlife's personal space. And, you know, different animals are gonna have a different personal bubble, just like people. Um, so, you know, look at that behavior, see what it is. And if you're noticing that the animal is continually being harassed at a certain length, maybe pick a different lens that's a little bigger. That makes a lot of sense, thank you. Yeah. Um, we have another question. Um, if you could talk a little bit more about truth and captioning and, um, uh, especially when you're photographing game farm animals um, and why it's important. Absolutely. Yeah, so truth and captioning, um, it's a topic that I could probably talk on for another hour. So I didn't add it on today's topic, but um, Nampa has a great truth and captioning document that I know a lot of people use. And there's really two elements to truth and captioning. And that is, um, it's the the how, how did I make it? So um, was the animal captive or wild? Um, and, you know, where did I, where did I take this? Um, things like that. And then also, what did I do with the picture when I was done with it? So what kind of digital alter altercations did I make to the picture? Um, so really pairing those things in. Um, when it comes to game farm animals, now that is probably another thought that guy could go on for another hour. Um, so game farms, if you're not familiar with what a game farm is, um, these are facilities that um, they house um, wild, wild animals that are born in captivity. They're kept in cages and they're brought out for photographers or filmmakers to pretend they're in nature. So a lot of times when you see these calendar pictures or these wolves that look just too good to be true or um, a very popular one is the Siberian tiger running through the snow at the camera or the mountain lion jumping across canyons, they're fake. So they're not real, um, they're not really captured in the wild. And most of the time photographers who are paying upwards of thousands of dollars to, to make these images, they're pretending that they're real. So they're being dishonest when they are posting these pictures. Um, so if you're going to go to a facility and you're gonna to pay to photograph these animals, 
at least be honest in what you're doing. Most publications will not accept these pictures. Most competitions will not accept these pictures. Um, and at least for NAMPA, I help moderate um, the social media. So if we see pictures like that and they're very clearly game farms, um, we will remove them from the site. And if it keeps happening, we'll actually bar the photographer from posting on those sites because we want to discourage people from um, being dishonest when they're posting pictures like that. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, going back to the question uh, about reporting uh, people who are maybe not following ethical guidelines, um, when you report someone that you see to a ranger or a, a wildlife uh, representative, do you take a picture of the person and show it to the ranger so that they can see the person? And um, have you found that the rangers take action when you do that? Absolutely. Um, yeah, so I always recommend documenting the situation. Um, for one, it's good education tools. Um, so definitely document it. Um, two, it's really helpful if you're going to do any sort of prosecution. So um, depending on how bad the offending situations are. So if you're touching baby animals or you are baiting animals or things like that and you're seeing that kind of thing um those actions are actually illegal and can cause fines or even jail time so having evidence is going to help actually prosecute those things um those situations more often than not um when i report behavior um the situation you know unless the ranger is right there and they're seeing it too um more often than not it's they're going to start maybe patrolling that area a little more closely than catching them in the act um but i would always recommend just letting you know let them know that what you saw again a photograph is always going to carry more weight um and we really want to discourage behavior like that because i mean there are animals for example, um, people were feeding grapes to black bears in Grand Tetons two years ago, and um, the bears started to come and approach cars because they were looking for grapes, and they ended up having to kill a mom and her three cubs mm. because people were being bad. So we just want to make sure that we're stopping that behavior as soon as possible. Gotcha. Um, we have a lot of questions from birders um, and people who like to photograph birds. Um, so you touched on this before, but um, we do have one question about the idea of playing, um, playing back bird calls. Um, and then also questions about photo etiquette when it comes to things like your um, shutter sound, um, respecting other birders without a camera and that sort of thing. Can um, you talk about that a little bit, please? Yeah. Um, so as far as bird calls go, um, there is a lot of controversy on that. Um, Particularly if you're in an area that birds are nesting, um, I would definitely say absolutely you should not be using bird calls. Um, when birds are nesting and they hear those bird calls, they're either doing one or two things. They're either abandoning their own nest to look for potential predators in the area. Um, so even if it's not the bird that you, you know, you're calling, they might be seeing that as a predator. So they're leaving their nests, things like that. Or um, if it is that type of bird, they might be looking for a mate. And so you're actually deterring them away from the mating behavior because you're faking them out. Um, so definitely not around, you know, springtime particularly. You want to try to avoid doing any bird calls like that. Um, but that goes for, you know, whether they're birds or any animals. When I see people using, say, elk noises to lure elk in, um, you're essentially taking them away from what they were doing and that's using up valuable energy. So unless you have a very good reason for bird calls and in some cases scientists, they do need to use those, those things in order to document animals to save them. So there's, oh, there's always gray area and I'm never gonna say everything is black and white, you know, and you never do something, but you should have a very good reason for using bird calls. Um, as far as, respecting photographers respecting birders um absolutely i think you should respect anyone you're out with and um for example when i'm in nebraska we're in blinds with a lot of birders um photographers are not allowed to use um the multi-shutter option so it's taking you know rapid fire 
um, they can only use single shots. So it's not quite as distracting. Um, not every camera has silent shutter. I wish they did. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of the mirrorless do. So I know their technology is moving that way. Um, so be respectful um, and, you know, try not to block block their view. I know you're trying to get a picture and oftentimes photographers think that they take priority because they're trying to, to make an image for somebody who is simply looking at the bird, but everybody has the right to be there. It's, you know, shared space and just be respectful. That makes a lot of sense. Um, on a sort of similar topic, uh, we have a question about um, night active amphibians and if there's any known disturbance or harmfulness of using flash photography um, on these animals. Yeah, there is a lot of studies and a lot of contradictory information coming out right now when it comes to flash, but um, I think it's very species based. Some, um, some wildlife, when you flash them with a the camera, they, it's like they didn't even notice and others it can impact their night vision. It can scare them away from an area. Um, so it's very species based and we really need to know what we're photographing before we flash them. Um, so a couple things to pay attention. If you, flash, if you flash an animal that you don't think you're gonna disturb and you notice it actively responding, you should stop. Um, if you are, um, using flash like in a, a particularly if you're using camera traps um, you need to make sure you're not doing multiple mul multiple flashes so it should flash once and then reset um, and then infrared is always preferred um, whenever possible um, so again just do your research know what you're photographing and if you do see it reacting it, it, you're harassing the animal gotcha um, so I do want to keep a, an eye on the time here. I don't want to go too far over. Um, real quick, I'll bring um, Debbie on and ask her a quick question. Um, so uh, one of the questions we have, Debbie, uh, has to do with tour groups. Um, when you have a group of maybe six to 12 people um, all together in the field and they're all sort of converging in the same place at the same time, um, what kind of advice can you offer um, in these situations to help mitigate um, any potential impact that you might have on the wildlife that you're seeing or photographing? Yeah, so when we are, um, when we're seeing large groups, definitely wildlife is more, you can see them becoming more and more stress. Um, so anytime the group can break into smaller groups, I highly recommend that. Um, when you are gathered in a group we need to make sure we're not circling around wildlife that's a really common thing that starts to happen they start to try to get different angles and all of a sudden you've now surrounded the animal which is not giving them a safe place to leave um, and then just like if you were by yourself if you're showing up and you're noticing the animal is starting to look stressed the group just needs to leave so guides need to take that on um, themselves and know when you know to tell the group we're done. I know you didn't, maybe you didn't get your picture. The animal's life is more valuable than that. Great. Um, Debbie, I think your audio is. Uh, I think you're muted. Muted. <laughs> Try. How there about we this? are. Hi, Debbie. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was going to say that I think that all of our guides are very respectful of that and they are, you know, they, as far as the use of bird calls and things like that as well, I think people um, are wanting to show, you know, the guides are wanting to show the animals and the birds, but they are very respectful of, of just what you're saying. If they seem disturbed and trying to get away, then it's like time to back up and move away and just stop using the, the call. I mean, they, they use them very sparingly, actually. The, our bird guides are, are very respectful like that. Good to know. Um, okay, I guess we'll go ahead and wrap it up with one last question um, and then um, kind of finish up with some closing remarks. If we didn't get your t to your question today, I'm sorry, um, but we will be kind of looking through those. And if there's anything specific, you can either email us um, and we'll be happy to uh, pass those over to Jennifer. You can email us at marketing at holbrooktravel.com. Um, or again, we'll be kind of looking through the questions that we received and, and we'll try to answer some of the ones that we didn't get to. So um, last question is, what is your favorite uh, animal to photograph? Uh, cheetahs, 
are my favorite. Um, they're the animal that got me started in wildlife photography um, in general. And I have had the great honor of photographing the both in the wild and in captivity um, at fundraising events for the Cheetah Conservation Fund. So very cool. fortunate. Wonderful. Well, um, so with that, um, I'll say thank you very much to Jennifer um, for joining us today. Um, it was very informative. I know we've gotten a lot of comments from people saying how informative it was and how much they enjoyed it. So thank you for, uh, for presenting and, and kind of educating us a little bit today. Um, it's a pleasure. Wonderful. Um, we have another webinar coming up a week from, uh, let's see, a week from yesterday. So it'll be next Wednesday, the 22nd for Earth Day. Uh, we'll be having a panel discussion to talk about different conservation initiatives from a few of our uh, partners and uh, sort of sharing a positive outlook for the future. Uh, we'll be joined by David Godfrey from the Sea Turtle Conservancy, um, Al Stenstrup, uh, an educator, and we'll have a few other people joining us as well. So we hope that you can make it and uh, keep an eye out for the invitation for that, which will be coming out soon. So. Um, with that, I think we can go ahead and wrap up. Thank you again so much to everyone who joined us today. Um, we will be sending out a recording of the webinar. So if you missed any part of it or um, wanted to watch any part of it again, you will be able to uh, we'll have a link to that so that you can watch it. And um, thank you again to Debbie. And thank you again to our uh, guest, Jennifer. And I uh, really appreciated your time today. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Wonderful. Well, everyone have a great rest of your day. Bye, everyone.